Uh, nearest neighbor algorithms are related, very closely related, to a very powerful uh, family of algorithms uh, based on kernels. So let's look at the relation there. So uh, we have our little data set in two dimensions here, two classes, blue and red. And uh, we're going to be looking at two different testing points, right? These, this, these uh, yellow crosses are the two different testing points. So suppose that we run a three nearest neighbor algorithm. Now what does it do? The three nearest neighbor algorithm for, uh, for this testing point, it's going to find the three nearest neighbors, and the three nearest neighbors happen to be uh, um, this point right there, this blue point, and this red point. And they are the points inside this uh, little uh, radius um, R. Right. So um, the three nearest neighbor algorithm would base the prediction on this region R, which has exactly three training examples in it. Now that's for this uh, testing point. If I look at a different testing point, it's also going to be three nearest neighbors, these three red points. But now the three nearest neighbors, they span a much narrower, a much sort of smaller region in space. Right? So for this instance, to get three nearest neighbors, I had to look pretty far. Uh, here, they're all nearby. And uh, the nearest neighbor algorithm always looks for a fixed number of closest neighbors. There is a very closely related, very similar algorithm to nearest neighbor. It's called Parson Window algorithm. And what it does is it says, instead of looking for a fixed number of neighbors, I'm going to look at regions of fixed area or fixed volume in space. So in that case, same data set, same two testing points. I am looking for a region of radius r and I'm going to use a region with a fixed radius for all the testing instances. So I'm going to use radius r for the left testing point and radius r for the right testing point. The difference is now the right testing point gets a lot more training examples to base its decision on. It's basically because a lot more points fall within the radius r. So difference between nearest neighbors and parson windows. Nearest neighbors, constant number of neighbors. Parson windows, constant radius. And as many neighbors as fall into that radius, you take them all and use them all for voting uh, on the class, whether the class is going to be positive or negative. Now, the classifications in this case will not actually change, um, but you see how the algorithm is different. It's either constant number of neighbors or constant volume in space. <clears throat> Now, uh, let's take this and play around uh, a little bit with this notion of a neighborhood. Because in both algorithms, you have neighborhoods, right? It's just in one case, the neighborhood is fixed number of entities, and the other uh, neighborhood is fixed volume. Um, so what does the algorithm actually do with the neighborhood? So suppose that what I do is for each, um, for each blue example, I assign its label as a plus one, and for each red example, I assign the label as minus one then what does the nearest neighbor algorithm do? What it does is it finds the neighborhood, that's my region R of x, the neighborhood around the testing instance x. And then within that, uh, within that neighborhood, it adds up all of the labels, all of the y values, right? So uh, it only works for, uh, for binary classification, but uh, anytime you get a blue, it, uh, it, uh, it, it, it adds plus one. Uh, anytime you get a red, it adds minus one. So in the end, uh, you will either get a positive number or a negative number. So uh, you, you're going to predict the value based on the sign of the summation, right? So if there's more plus ones, you'll classify it as blue. If there's more minus ones, you'll classify it as, as red. So overall, the prediction for testing point x looks like that. It's the, it's the sign of the sum of the labels for the points x, i within the neighborhood r of x. Okay. Now, let's rewrite it like that. So, uh, in the first sum, I was summing up over those instances that fall within a neighborhood. Uh, and I can rewrite it as a sum that goes over all the training instances, all of them. Uh, but I have an indicator function. And this indicator function is going to be 1 if the 
training instance is inside my neighborhood, and it's going to be zero if it's outside. Okay, so um, is, it, is, it, is it clear why they are equivalent? Because when the indicator function is zero, that's basically saying this point doesn't matter. So it's outside of my neighborhood, so I'm not going to count it. Okay. So, um, so all I'm doing is I'm just taking the yi, the target for the ith example, and multiplying it by the syndicator function. And the syndicator function, uh, it tests whether the training example xi is inside the neighborhood for x. And the way it does that is it computes the Euclidean distance and then checks, is that smaller than my radius? If it is, then you're inside my neighborhood. Otherwise, you're outside. Okay. So nice and simple. Now let's try to plot it and see what it looks like uh, graphically. So suppose that um, this is my uh, testing uh, instance, the, the, the yellow cross. Um, and on the x-axis, I'm going to plot the distance, the Euclidean distance from that um, testing point. Okay. So uh, now next to that test, it's that testing point right there, the one in the, in the, in the, in the middle of the big, uh, of the, of the big region. Right? Right next to it, there is a blue example. So that has a small distance to the origin. Uh, and then I have to go quite far, but pretty soon I'm going to hit a red example right there. And right next to it, there is a blue example. And then there's a couple more red examples. And then there is that blue example right there. And the red example there. And the blue example there. OK. So what I'm doing is I'm plotting all the training examples. I'm projecting them all into one, uh, into a single dimension, which is the distance from the testing point, okay? So this is just the, di just the difference, just the Euclidean uh, distance between the test point x and every uh, training point. Now, look at the syndicator function and see what it does. What does the syndicator function do? It says that all the points that are closer than a certain radius r get a 1. And all the points that are further than that radius r get a 0. So if I tried to plot that, it would look kind of like that. Right? Up to a certain radius r, I get a 1. And then below that radius r, I get a 0. Now you look at that, and you'll notice, hmm, it's kind of interesting. So for this particular setting of r, the classification would be blue. Because right? within the region, you have two blue points and one uh, red point. But if I moved it ever so slightly, right? if I moved it left, a little bit. If I made R a little bit smaller, then I would have one red and one blue, and now you're breaking a tie. So it could actually end up being red. Uh, and if I moved it right a little bit, it would end up being red as well. Right? So you have this property that um, this radius R, um, it's, it, it's, it's, it, it's adding some variance to your classification. If you, if you make it a little bit larger, it could change the classification one way. If you make it a little bit smaller, it could change the classification again. So that's something that's not terribly desirable. If you make a small change to a parameter, you shouldn't get, you sh it shouldn't flip your prediction so easily. Uh, so what can we do uh, to get rid of that? One way to get rid of that is to replace this boxy function with something that is a little bit smoother. So suppose that instead of a function that was constant 1 up until a certain point and then boom, dropped down to 0, suppose that I had a function that decays more gradually. So a function that starts at 1 for points that are very, very close to my testing instance and then gradually decays with distance. Okay. So um, now that function, uh, it, 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 it'll have a certain set of properties. I won't actually, um, um, I, I shouldn't go into too much detail, but that function, there is, there is a name for it, and you've seen it already. It's something that you would call a kernel. It's a function that looks at distances and converts distances to, uh, to numbers, where smaller distances will correspond to higher numbers, and large distances will correspond to smaller numbers. But for now, just, just think of it this way. What you're doing is you are, uh, you are replacing this uh, box, which has an abrupt fall from 1 to 0, with something that has a smoother decay. So what's the effect of this? The effect of doing that is you are no longer treating all the neighbors equally. You're giving more credit to neighbors that are closer to you and progressively less and less weight 
to neighbors that are far away from you. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of voting, I guess you're going to believe a lot to the vote of this guy, and you're going to believe a lot less to the votes of these guys. But they still count. And if there is a lot of them, they can overrule the vote of a training instance that was very, very close to you. So what you're doing is you are now relate, you're putting a confidence on each of the votes, on each of the training instances, based on how far away they are from your testing point. And what that will do is that will remove the variance that happens in the KNN algorithm due to the varying value of K, and it will remove the variance that happens in the Parson window algorithm due to the radius. Because now you don't have this abrupt fall where the point is either in or out. All the points are in your neighborhood. It's just some have a lot more vote than others. So if we rewrite our little formula in terms of decaying Carnell functions, then what we're doing is we're really just replacing the syndicator function with a Carnell between the testing point x and a training point xi. So uh, where k is based on the distance between x and xi and sort of decays from a large value to uh, a small value. <clears throat> now you look at this form and you stare at it for a long, long time and you should see something. You have seen something like this before. You have seen it very recently. Yes. You have seen it in the last lecture. So this is the prediction function for the support vector machine. And this is the prediction function for the kernelized nearest neighbor classifier. And this is not any support vector machine. This is actually a kernelized support vector machine. Because right? uh, that's, the, that, that's the kernel. Okay. So look at it for a second and just try to see. That's a nearest neighbor classifier with kernels. That's a support vector machine with kernels. What is the difference? They're almost identical, but there is one crucial difference. Alpha eyes, what are they? So these are the weights that a support vector machine assigns to the individual instances in the training data set. And remember, Nigel talked about the SVM solution being sparse, right? So most of these alpha eyes are actually zero, and they're non-zero. Really what matters is which ones are zero and which ones are non-zero. So what the support vector machine does is it picks out a certain subset of training examples and it makes every and, and it cancels out everything else. For everything else, the alpha i is zero. And for a kernelized nearest neighbor, it's not. So one way to see a relationship between the nearest neighbor algorithm and a support vector machine is in terms of the instances that they use to make the decision. Right? The nearest neighbor algorithm for a testing point uses the instances that are the closest to it. The support vector machine uses the instances that define the max margin, the instances that are closest to the opposite class. That's the way to think of them. Uh, but the functional form is surprisingly similar.